Okay. Mark Hounschild, Separations of Concerns. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you Trivago for helping to get online and everything is working now. That's great. Yeah, separation of concerns um, is uh, the topic of my talk and um, this is something I'm uh, doing in my work in the Federal Office of Agriculture and Food and we have a special use case for this because unlike most of you guys, I think, but uh, maybe not all, um, we are having a corporate identity and we must put it on quite a lot of things um, which can be um, tools for um, people who are um, maintaining databases and they need a web interface or of course for our own uh, homepage also and they have all the same corporate identity and we have a lot of things which are technically the same like a table we have to put them in many different applications and they have to look the same all the time and um, we are not doing this with the uh, same tools. We have uh, PHP, Java, each are coming with their own frameworks. We have TYPO3 as a CMS and um, yeah, all these things are mixed together and we have to find a way that we can take a table and tell the programmer, okay, this is what I would look, uh, what it should look like and um, I must take the table then put it somewhere else and it should be looking the same again if it's the same corporate identity but sometimes it's also necessary that it looks different so um, yeah I'm a little bit further than this one um, small disclaimer I'm not here officially speaking for the Federal Office of um, Agriculture and uh, Food, I must say this before I'm really starting, okay? So uh, this is the way I'm doing, but the, what I'm talking about, separation of concerns and why this is important is my own opinion, and yeah. This is what I was uh, talking right now, and um, yeah, so we need code fragments which we can reuse and um, uh, in different situations which normally should look the same and I don't want to write an own CNS if a table is appearing in one um, application and then I have to write the same uh, another CSS for making it looking the same this is waste of time and so I was uh, trying around how to do this and the only way to achieve this is to separate the concerns. That means what we were hearing today before already, we have to uh, use um, HTML in the way it was meant. And when we're doing this, I was trying to find uh, some reasons for doing it, three, four, five, and I ended up with six and a plus, and um, yeah, this is makes accessibility easier. I will explain to her where it is helping. It makes progressive enhancement easier because Pure HTML is the first step, what you are getting, and it's already an accessible website if you're not doing anything else. Um, it uh, keeps it smart and simple. Everything else you're putting on later, Bootstrap or whatever, it's making it more complicated. We will, we will see this. Um, allow specialists to work together. And what I'm meaning with this is that you, um, when you're separating the concerns of making something look somehow or working somehow or if you're giving your homepage just the structure, um, it makes it possible that people are working independently on their part. And um, yeah, two I was adding tonight after listening to Charlie Owen, <laughs> because the first thing is uh, you should respect these constraints. Just don't try to make something else because it's coming in handy for this one moment because it will make you problems later and on the other hand it makes you free from unnecessary constraints because if you're using bootstrap and you're putting in a lot of classes which are presentational classes you cannot reuse this thing somewhere else and you're putting yourself uh, constraints which are just not necessary and plus if you're working with pure HTML you don't have to learn a framework which might sound um, 
um, stupid because frameworks should make it easier for us, but I know a lot of people that are working together as a freelancer and also here in my uh, main job. And if I'm asking them, I want to have this HTML, and they are starting to complain, oh, you know, my framework is putting out this HTML this way, and this has reason, and I say, I don't need this, and I'll need it another way, and then they have to find out how to do this. Normally, they are made to use it, and when they are using it, uh, they are just trying to make a job done, and they never get the time to really understand and to learn it. This is my experience, not because they don't want to, but they have their daily work and there is very often not enough time for learning the things that they are using to work for. And if I'm coming with my special HTML that I want to have, they in this moment only try to find out how to do this. And this is making things sometimes more um, complicated and this is why this plus you don't have to learn the framework is standing here. Okay, um, so if you're th I'm thinking about reusable code and I'm seeing table, class, table, table, stripe, table, dark, it's completely ob obvious to everybody if I want to have the table light that I cannot use this and I must go there and change it. And um, yeah, first thing, the, uh, the class and the thing named table, um, yeah, I don't know what this is for or a button needs a class button. Um, write less than code. I'm aware that at least one thinks that this is a good uh, thing to do here. And uh, my tables normally start like table and that's it. And if I have a table for something special and I know this already, I'm writing the meaning, a semantic class name into it. In this case, it's for example in a contact form, so it's getting the class contact form. And I'm able later then to decide I want this contact form to look exa exactly the same like most others, or if not, I can write some CSS for making it looking different, and I can reuse this um, HTML. Um, I can make it yeah green, pink tables for whatever. And um, funny thing is. I found out only when I was starting to use WordPress that WordPress is coming without the possibility to put tables into pages. You have to install a plugin for making this. And I thought, this is so completely stupid. Uh, everybody needs tables, yes, right? But I found out that I'm using this plugin on only very few sites. <laughs> Most sites um, don't need tables. But if you're using, for example, Bootstrap, it comes with all the CSS which is necessary to style tables and normally I know you can take things out of it but we all know and uh, we are in the, um, we have little time and normally we are not uh, tailoring bootstrap this way like you should do it maybe. Yeah, and normally when I'm doing things like this they should always look the same. Um, Remember why we invented CSS in the first place? We had the text, for example, in a paragraph, and we're putting in big color green and uh, font size. I don't remember the syntax completely. Something like this that should be big. And yes, I'm a headline, but uh, this was clear for everybody who can see, but for nobody else. Um, we were not um, dealing with accessibility in the beginning a lot, and so this was fine, but we were writing it a hundred times. And uh, if we wanted to change it, we had to change it in another, once again, in hundreds of places. And this was really not something nice to do. And you can argue, okay, today when you're using a, a content management system, system or even in the individual programming, you change it only in one place. This might be okay from working and maintaining, but what if you have to change it in seven of ten places? this sooner or later will not work. So um, I think this is important to have no presentational markup in the, uh, in the HTML. So don't write that something should look like something because this is what CSS is made for. And you have much less effort. And uh, thanks Hayden for this great example yesterday. Um, this is so cool if you can make it just worked by a few uh, lines of CSS and you never have to touch this HTML again. We're 
again, this is uh, so, um, it was an eye opener that 15 years also me, uh, I'm arranging boxes inside of boxes. <laughs> and um, you can do this with just CSS and this is making things much easier. And um, yeah, table stripes, I, I'm going a little bit faster now. I think the uh, point is made. Um, you can make it like this and uh, you have a background color and you have the vision, yeah, what you want your um, H1, like what it should like and somebody is saying, I want it completely different and you just write this uh, three lines of CSS and it's done in every uh, place on the homepage where you want to look at like this. And you have very little effort to make some of them different. If you designers coming um, saying, um, I want, uh, I need an H1 in the footer, but it look, uh, should look a little bit different. You're writing just footer, blank, H1, and you're done. You're making something else in there. So you don't need classes at all for, uh, yeah, in most of the case. This one is uh, how to make a grid in Bootstrap. No, not making the grid is just how you use it but um, this is the HTML for this. In the first place, you need a container for um, putting rows in, and this is already a big disadvantage because if you want to use later CSS grid, you cannot do anything with this because um, in grid you have the possibility, you can do th things with this, but it's giving you limitations which are not necessary because in CSS grid you can use uh, tw uh, two-dimensional grid, but if you have a row, how you want to go out of there? And if you're placing later something which is in the next row and it should be in the first row, you're getting problems until subgrid is not working in every row. Then maybe you can even reuse this HTML, but still there's a lot of bloat that you don't need. This is one element less, three attributes less, and a lot of lengthy values less. Yeah, that's all unnecessary. And um, yeah, this is not doing completely the same. I was uh, just trying to do something which was fitting on this <laughs> screen. Uh, you should do this more uh, better, yes. But this is also already looking similar than what uh, Bootstrap is trying to do with all of this code. And don't forget there's much more CSS behind than this little thing. Normally I would use grid also for this, but this is just to show that only in these three lines there is something looking quite similar. Um, yeah, we can do much more things with grid than we can do with bootstraps. I'm not working with bootstraps very often, so I was talking to people if you can do this, and this was the answer what's not possible. For example, there are much more things, boxes over two or more rows of the grid, columns with um, which are five of uh, 12 grid columns. You make it six, you can make it four, you can make it three. Somehow, I don't know why, you cannot make five. If it's true or not, I'm not sure. I'm not working with it very often. But you cannot let uh, boxes in the same place overlapping each other. And all these things you can do with grid much more. Find a lot of examples and learning at gridexample.com from Rachel Andrew. And... Um, yeah, one thing is when I'm, what I'm hearing all the time, everybody's using Bootstrap, so we should use it also. But uh, I say no, I don't like it because it was outdated already when it came out. All major browsers supported uh, CSS Grid. And um, yeah, I don't think there is any reason for using Bootstrap anymore if it is about Grid. But there are more things coming with Bootstraps and these are the components. You can use it out of the box. Bootstrap 4 is fairly um, accessible, but um, the problem with this is actually the last sentence here. When you use Bootstrap, normally you stop looking for other things, for better things. And once again, Bootstrap may be outdated in uh, some kind of um, meanings. It's, uh, making again constraints because you are taking what's in there already because you have it and you're not looking for better ones. And um, 
Yes, there are cool things like inclusive components uh, dot design, which are not only um, shown and you can use it right away from there, but which are explained so you're learning why it is working this way and you understand why it is important to do this it, this way. You have uh, components from Scott O'Hara and, the, uh, by the way, inclusive components to give the credit to Hayden. He's here today. Um, there are things like uh, accessible car carousel at um, vanilla yet, and uh, um, the able player, the player I'm uh, liking most of all uh, multimedia players. You can make a lot of cool things of this, and uh, it's good for video and audio. And I want to show you something what I like very much about it. Um, when you're playing a video, you see the subtitles. Oh, you don't see them. It's only on my screen. Can I put it there? Ah, yeah. It's not important what they are saying. I was I told them I don't need a um, sound, but when it's uh, you see here the text which is uh, set here, which is already nice, and you can uh, go along reading it. And um, what I like more, much more, this is uh, for people who. Um, cannot listen, for example. But as a person who can listen and see, you can click on these things. And the video is jumping to the place where this is set. And I like this very much. And why I like to show it all the time, accessibility is good for everybody. And this is not only for people with disadvantages. If you see this, this is completely nice, comfortable thing to use for everybody who has no need for it. But it's just nice to have like an elevator when you're able to walk stairs or something like this. If you're making a web page um, accessible, it will be better for everybody. OK, um, stop this. And we're going to the next slide. I don't find my mouse. Ah, OK. Yeah, and then next argument I'm hearing for using Bootstrap is it's coming with a doku. And uh, yeah, this is for me the least important thing because all the things I was talking about, the able player, the components I was saying, they are all coming with the doc documentation. If you need more infos, you can go to the Mozilla De Developer Network. Uh, there are great accessibility blocks uh, around. And uh, I was linking um, on the blog that, was, that is listing more than 50 of them. You can have a look on this. Um, I don't know, but I think the um, slides will be put later there somewhere. Yoshi? Some, yeah. So you will find this, and all the links are in there, and you can look at them. And um, yeah, there are uh, Facebook pages, groups, and anything, people who are dealing with this, and you can ask them, and so just uh, go there and by the way um, HTML and CSS and all these things are also uh, documented yeah we have the specifications and everything okay yeah so how to work without bootstrap um, in our case I've made my own workbox toolset I don't want to say framework because it's not because it's lacking an important part of the frameworks, it has no layout. I'm putting then the, C, the HTML that I want to receive from the programmers, and I say, tell them, no matter what you're doing, how you're doing it, this is what I need as an output. And um, you take this and you integrate it in your um, framework that you are using. You are Put, make templates on your own in your uh, integrated development or environment, or whenever it's coming in handy, you just copy and paste it from the repository. It's a GitHub repository where I have it, and you take it and you're done, maybe already. So this should be some work which you're doing once, and then you forget about it, and you have all these things in the tools you're using every day. And because it's so simple, actually, you don't need a doku. Of course, I was putting this not only in the repo, but I was writing a little bit for everything. But actually, you just copy and paste it, and you're done. So it's easy to use. 
and yeah, impact of teams. I was saying um, why the, uh, it's important because I think not everybody can do everything. CSS became uh, so complex, it's only CSS nobody has in his head. And um, specializations make sense because this is also for everybody who is programming. If you're working with JavaScript and all these um, frameworks and you really want to know your frameworks, this is really a lot to learn and not only once, but they are developing further and you have to uh, keep up with this. And I think specialization makes a lot of sense because it makes you better in the things you are doing, although you should know a little bit of what, about what other people are doing, but I think this is making um, better web pages. I know it can be difficult, especially for small agency, but if you have 10 or 15 developers, it should be possible that one of them is only dealing with HTML, CSS, and accessibility, and um, the others are making the programs. And I hope you can try it and you find out that uh, I'm true. Uh, it works for us. We are about 20 developers in our team, and um, I'm the one who is not able to write any program. I don't know JavaScript, I don't know PHP, I'm not a type of three integrator. I'm just making accessible um, HTML and CSS from what the designer is giving me to make it look like it should and uh, behave in the browser, and that's all. And that's enough for me. I can promise you I have a lot to learn only with this uh, few things. And um, yeah, maybe let's see a little bit of code, if there's time left. I wasn't... Hmm? Okay, so... Um, the first thing I would like to show you from uh, real life, it's a quite new example. Um, this is... If I find my mouse... Ah, here it is. Um, this is code taken from a uh, type of... No, you don't see it. Here it comes. Uh, I would like to make it on the whole side, but then I have to find my mouse again. I think this is already quite clear what's happening here. Um, this is uh, long, long lines, and you have all these uh, classes which... Uh, are familiar for a lot of people from you. I think there's bootstrap in it. Here we have this nice thing called icon font, which needs a lot of classes and extra element e, what is not meant for using it for these things. Um, of course, we should use SVGs for this. I'm not going into this. There are enough um, articles about this, why and how to use SVG. Sprites over icon fonts. So um, this is what we have. And I was thinking this must be possible to make it easier, and I came up with this. And um, the same content, I was not reducing anything in these um, selection boxes, it's everything the same, the uh, um, content did not change, but the HTML. And surprisingly, it was 25 kilobyte before, and now it is um, four. It's uh, six times smaller although it has the same content. So all the bloat was just in the HTML. And this was a real eye-opener because when I made uh, the first CSS design, before we were making um, um, layout tables, the site I was working on was 36 kilobytes and I came up with six. So once again, 20 years later, <laughs> I was reducing six uh, I made it six times more. And this is uh, completely stupid because we don't have to do this. We have much more sophisticated and um, uh, tools. We have much more knowledge. CSS is more powerful than ever before. And once again, we are working with this um, HTML, which is much, much bigger than necessary. And um, this is not making things easier. Because if you have to work with it like me, and I have to f uh, find my way through a hundred of diffs, including nothing else than just one single uh, diff more. 
and once again and once again and once again you're <laughs> about to get crazy and if you're then trying to some, do something sophisticated like we saw yesterday from Hayden once again uh, sorry that I'm mentioning so often but I'm a big fan <laughs> uh, so um, yeah you uh, or not you I am about to go crazy when I'm seeing all these things and uh, have to find my way through all this stuff. Not only that I cannot find it because we have the developer tools and you find the place uh, uh, sooner or later where you have change, to change something, but it ma it's making some things impossible because some things are s nested so deeply and you need it uh, higher up in the hierarchy and the HTML and you cannot put it there. And then I have to go to the programmer which has no time or is ill or is on a vacation this one who was writing this, and I might I need to find somebody else who is doing this for me, and this is the place where it's making things difficult and complicated. Okay, uh, let's get to the next. I oh, now I see now to the next slide. Um, there's a good thing in. Um, There is one good thing about presentational markup, and this is it's making things more readable. Uh, what I mean with this is, if you have a green button and a gray button and a small button and a big button, it's easy to call them green button and gray button and a big button and small button. But it's not necessary to write this in your HTML. This is you see my uh, JS pane is completely empty just. The reason why it's open, so you see that there's nothing going on. Um, we have completely semantic HTML, and there nowhere there's a small or big button. But we have button, button small, button gray in our SAS. And there is this cool extend um, function, I think it's called. And uh, I can write everything that I need for a small button and for a gray button. and Later on, I will put it on the right place. Um, I'm sorry that I, I here, not faster with this, but I the mouse is so small um, that I can say if I need a submit in the header because there's a search form normally, I extend it with button and with button small, and it's completely easy to read, completely easy to maintain, and my HTML stays clean. The same with green button. It results in a little bit more CSS than necessary because what's happening here, here is um, written that the button should look like this, including the green background. And when I'm writing button gray, then afterwards he's saying it should be gray, so there's a line more CSS than necessary in the output. But I think this is the way, uh, this is something you can live with after compressing it. This is not a lot of problem. Compared with the HTML you are saving, especially the uh, CSS file is um, going over the uh, line only once, but HTML is coming with every page again and again and again. I think this is a little, yeah, this is not, uh, this is something you can live with easily. And um, yeah, for the credits, this is uh, something from a talk I took away from uh, Gunnar Bittersmann and um, you can have the link to this talk here also. Yeah, um, so what I'm suggesting is to change the way you're working. I'm quite aware that not everybody is going out here and now tomorrow is working a different way. We have people who are leading agencies here and most of you are not, so you have to do what your boss is telling you and uh, I know also that uh, yeah, you're used to the way you work. Um, and if you're working with Bootstrap already, then you will not change it from one day to another. But I wanted to give you a um, glance on what you can gain. And maybe you start with a smaller project where you can um, try things out, maybe with your own homepage with all the deadlines, something like this. And maybe you will find it so um, appealing, so 
working so good like I did. And yeah, that's it. Um, except normally when I was making this talk before, I was going on with uh, some code and um, I was using once again an example of Hayden Pickering uh, sortable tables and I was writing him already before I found one issue with this and I would like to show this and maybe we can talk uh, about this in the afternoon so this is the reason why I want to show it. Maybe there are other people who are interested in this as well. Um, I think it's in the Firefox, yep. Here it is. So, I know there should be shortcuts. Here it is. And um, I don't know if it's able to see everything good with this is really great uh, component you should check it up but we have one uh, or I have one problem with the uh, um, icons here um, and what was confusing me with this is when you're clicking on it it changes because obviously you can sort this and when you're clicking on it once it's uh, the arrow is up and which means this is an ascending order. What's happening now, it's logical, correct. It's uh, by the first name, Barney, Dean, Jeff, John, that the lowest uh, value is on the top and the highest value, it's much more obviously with the uh, numbers, is on the bottom. But when I see this thing, I expect the highest le uh, one to be on the top which is not logical because the reading direction is like this. So this is something which was confusing me and I was only to find out in which order it is when I was checking it by myself. When I saw the number and I know which number is higher than the other one, I only understand the icon. So this is a little bit difficult. This is a problem which was addressed in the bit test we had in Germany before where it was tested. If every icon has a visible name. Earlier we made this with hover text because everybody was using a mouse. Now not everybody is using a mouse anymore. Even people without disadvantages because they need uh, to see something on the touch um, devices. And we cannot do this. So normally we have to make a place in our design to put text there. Ascending or descending or something. And um, this is just one example. And um, there are much more icons which are confusing. For example, most people of us didn't ever use diskettes. I'm a little bit older than most of you. I was using them, but still we have a diskette symbol for saving things. Nobody of the younger people never had this in their hand. And maybe they are already wondering what kind of sign is there. So icons are misunderstandable. And uh, I think this is an important topic. And I didn't find any success criterion in the WCAG, which is addressing it. And I was uh, suggesting it. And now it's on the list. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm good, then I'm the one to blame that you may be not good when you're making access accessible web pages in the future. Because I think it will be one in one of the future versions. So maybe this is something we can talk about. Maybe everything is clear. I don't know. This is such a suggestion for a talk, maybe in the afternoon. Now I'm really done. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Ah. We've got a few minutes for questions again, maybe 10 at max. Is there anything you want to ask, Mark? Thank you very much, Mark. I'm, I'm going to be one of those terrible people. This is, this is not a question. It's <laughs> no, okay. I actually, but it's not like I'm doing. I'm criticising. I think it's a fantastic talk. I really like it when people talk about separation of concerns. I don't think we talk about that enough. Bring back CSS Zen Garden. I say. Um, I just wanted to second that. I think that would be a really good thing to discuss. I think it's a deeply, somewhat philosoph philosophical sort of yeah. thing behind buttons. That do they have their um, what they're representing? Is it the current state that they're in? Or is it the state that they will go into after you press them? Yeah. 
I figured, I, I mean, I guess your typical button, it would be, it would be uh, saying, if you press this, it will do this. Um, I guess here I settled on just kind of it doesn't matter because if you press the button, just the change was enough to go, oh, okay, I see. So then if I press it again, it will be the other way up. Like you kind of learn as you go along. But it's still, I think, the general idea of, you know, um, do, do buttons represent their current state or a different state is, I, it's something I'd like to talk about this afternoon, maybe, because um, that, that has a lot of implications. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and throw it, okay? Uh, hi, awesome presentation. Um, you had one slide where you were uh, kind of showing CSS code regarding how to build a button component. And as I saw, you named your uh, placeholders in SAS like the colors that you were assigning to them. Like yeah. there was something like button gray. It was um, in the code pen. Yeah. Yes. Usually, I'm always struggling with um, how to give these names because at a certain day, the, the gray button might turn into blue once a designer decides for it. Is there a certain workaround that you would recommend? Because we started once naming them after numbers, which is maybe not the best approach. Um, but I would just like to hear your opinion about this topic. No, the, uh, what I'm doing is normally I'm giving it no name at all because it's quite often happening that no matter what you're using in the uh, sidebar or in the footer or in the header, they are looking different like in the content area, for example. And you don't need anything more anymore if it's in the header. And if it's the main header, it's the only header which is in the HTML element. So you can use the child selector for this. Um, you have no need for classes or names or anything like this. But when you are um, going then deeper into the SAS, like I made it to make uh, understandable that this button is red or green or whatever, you th I think you should really write it uh, into it because it's making it much, much more readable. Just write that it's red with a green border or whatever. You have, this is such, uh, what's nice, even if you have very long names in it, they don't appear in the CSS. In the CSS, there's only the selector you were writing before, like um, footer, uh, space, and uh, H1, or button, or whatever you have there. And so the long names, which are talking names, which you can understand, they're not appearing in the um, code you're delivering to the client. Name it what is most understandable and most convenient. This is the beauty of this solution, that you can write any name that you want and nobody will know about it. You can reason yes. write <laughs> that something is shit. And in case that um, the button color in general will be redefined from gray to blue, you would just search and replace, go over the whole, whole style mm. sheet. And Normally you have a default vision for things like links or buttons and you, this is what you are writing first and then you're just writing uh, in the best case, the semantic, and if it's not helping, then the vision of the thing. Sorry, I was pr pr pressing this delightful yeah. soft microphone thing. It's wonderful. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to help clarify in my head and hopefully for others. So, to be clear, this approach is HTML first, server-side rendered. By doing that, you are getting accessibility for free by having it as semantic HTML. You th apply base styles to the HTML primitives, to the HTML elements, for example, tables, headings, things like that, yes. And these receive C uh, basic CSS styles. And then on a per need basis, on a per component basis, you add styles to make it look appropriate in context. Have I understood that correctly? Um, no, no, in this uh, repo, for, which is for paste and copy, uh, copy and paste uh, mainly, um, there's only HTML and no CSS, no basic styling, because I'm getting this design from a designer and uh, 
if I know there will be tables, it's just in my normal CSS file and um, everything's in there. And if I put it into another context which would look this uh, different, it's coming with its own uh, CSS style, uh, file. So, um, there, so there's no there's basic no need styling for basic on HTML? Styling. No, nothing at all. Okay. So that I don't have to overwrite it or anything. This only HTML. Okay. I'd like to talk to you about af about that afterwards. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Fine. And thanks a lot, Mark. It was a nice thing. Thank you for listening.